Hello and welcome to the Friday edition of The Conversation. I am Sibusi Suenyanda. And on today's show, we're looking at global research that shows an all-time high in dissatisfaction with democracy. That's less than 50% of the world's population saying they don't have faith in the government. The year 2020 will also see over 10 presidential and legislative elections in Africa, where many of the democrat democracies, pardon me, are new. In this episode, we ask, is the notion of of democracy in crisis. The conversation starts now. As usual on the conversation, we're joined by experts and colleagues, no different today as usual. Chukudi Ezugu, who's a public affairs analyst, as well as Peter Adeshina, who as well is a public affairs analyst. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very gentlemen. much. Okay, so we're talking about the, the touchy topic of democracies across the globe not doing well, but we're obviously going to zero in on Africa. Um, so let's just help you with a bit of an intro here. A report was conducted by researchers at Cambridge University, and it shows that the proportion of people who have given up on the notion of democracy um, is at 57.5%. Shifts in satisfaction levels were open, were often a response to objective circumstances. They include economic shock and, of course, corruption scandals, which we as Africa know all too well about. Now, as we get to host a dozen presidential or general elections this year, leaders are seeking to evade term limits. There's armed conflict in some of our countries and, of course, efforts by external actors to shape the outcomes. Those remain the key challenges that we face here um, in terms of the survival of our democracy. So my first question is firstly going to be, what does this mean for democracy as we know it? You know, if globally the notion is is, is depreciating, the, the value of the notion is depreciating. And then in Africa, we're seeing more and more people saying they don't trust the government. We're seeing voter apathy, people aren't going to the polls. What does that mean for this idea as we know it? So um, Abraham Lincoln popularly defined democracy as government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So irrespective of the manifestation, yeah. when you look at those that administer the affairs of a collective, you must notice popular participation and you must see inclusion. But it is really very unfortunate that, you know, going by the principle of social contract, since we can all not be in government, certain people hold positions in trust. Now, these people have mismanaged that opportunity. And so rather than people see the dividends of democracy, they see maladministration. Mm -hmm. And in the end, they wonder what exactly is the essence if it is supposed to be about popular will. And we have a handful of people, you know, administering over their affairs and enjoying themselves, enriching themselves, corruption scandals everywhere, and yet to appear like they are okay or, you know, they are satisfied with whatever, you know, government is, you know, um, how government is run, then it's a major problem. So people would look at it and say, well, since it doesn't follow with the definition and our expectations have been cut short, we do not believe in this system. And what many of these people do is try to circumvent the system to the point where people lose faith and lose hope. Where there is voter apathy, it means that people would not come out. Yeah. And if people don't participate in the process, those who participate in the process will continue to enthrone those who want to perpetuate themselves in power. So that is the unfortunate dilemma that Af many countries in Africa have to contend with today. And it's really very, very bad. It portends a lot of danger for democracy. And definitely scary because we have so many elections, a dozen we're looking at this year alone. But I just want to look at, you know, the global figure as well. So 70%, this is research now that comes from Edelman, 70% of the world's population say that uh, democracy as we know it is yes. losing its, its its effectiveness as a form of governance. So if, if this is the numbers we're looking at here, are we ready sincerely to have a conversation about alternative means of governance? I don't think so. Um, as you said, many of the things that reinforces the belief that democracy has lost its effectiveness is actually a wrong application of democracy yeah. in a sense. Uh, you know, it's a contested concept across the world. There is the Marxist version of democracy, there is the liberal democracy, that's what mm -hmm. they call electoral democracy mm -hmm. and the like. But across the board, there are some certain elements that, are, that must be present for democracy to say have taken place. They include civil liberties, uh, they include a credible and transparent electoral process. 
Uh, they also include a constitution and its implementation. They also include, um, you know, respect for freedoms, uh, you know, pluralism, which means that people should be able to identify yeah. diversity and all of that. But if you look at many countries, particularly in the West today, all of these are being eroded. Mm. You look at America, for instance, the concept of gerrymandering means that some people do not get their votes to count. So it means that you can live in a district, for instance, and no matter how you vote, a certain candidate of a particular party mm. is guaranteed to win every election. Mm. This causes disillusionment. People begin to disbelieve in the process. So I think that instead of having a conversation on possible alternatives, we should begin to look at the problems of democracy in specific countries because uh, democracies apply different across the globe. Uh, there's always a modification of structure and also process to localize the concept of democracy in each and every country. So we need, we need to highlight all of these countries, look at the challenges one by one and see how we can solve the problem. Because what are the alternatives that are there? Monarchy, uh, you know, theocracy, these are all tested forms of government that, are, that have actually failed. You know, they promote corruption, they promote opacity and all the like. So I think that instead of talking about um, alternative to democracy, we should talk about strengthening democracy mm -hmm. and fixing the challenges that have uh, risen in the past few years. But then, so what do you do? I, I like that, you know, you've, you've mentioned some of the tenets of democracy that are actually at issue here. It's not necessarily the structure of democracy as we know it. But now you have organizations uh, that are supposed to be checking, doing these checks and balances, yes. right? We recently had a conversation about the Corruption Perceptions Index. Yes. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, your, your um, corruption watch. You have several of these organizations. You also have regional bodies and you have international organizations that are supposed to be essentially ensuring that, you know, we're doing what we should as yes. governments. But when these are essentially uh, when, when these reports are, are then released yes. and leaders of governments will say one of two things either they refuse to acknowledge uh, what these reports are saying or on the other hand they'll just tell you we continue to thrive to do better and that's all we're going to do i'm quoting a particular government here that said this recently what then do we do i think that what we need to do is to encourage mass participation in politics that is the panacea to you know this um, problem mass participation in politics many of these leaders act this way because they know that their behavior would not be punished you know if you live in a country where you understand that you, you only need to you know pander to a particular political base for you to get re-elected you can behave as you and if you look at many democracies across the world, only a few people get to elect those who form the government. Mm. So they only try to meet the demands of these few people. Let's bring it down to Nigeria, for instance. We know those who vote, and we know the areas where votes are the most. And we know the things to pander to, things like religion, things like tribalism. Now, many people, when they get into, into office, they are animated by these sentiments. They only appeal to them and ignore concrete issues that actually strengthen democracy. So in the absence of all of this, what then that means is that they can behave as they wish without any real punishment. So I think that what can solve this problem is to begin to educate people on why they must participate in politics. Because uh, the, the defining element in democracy is the rule of the people. And now, I think that there is a huge gulf between the rule of the people and the will of the people. Political outcomes don't reflect what the people actually want in many democratic countries in the world. But this must change, and the only way it can change is when many people begin to participate in, in politics, begin to demand for a change, because they cannot ignore all of these things for so long. We have seen uprisings in many states. In the Middle East, for instance, there's beginning to be a relaxation of totalitarianism yeah. in those countries. So when people begin to participate a lot more, I think that all of this is going to be rolled back. And then we can begin to see better institutions that are actually more independent and do not act according to the wish of the few against the majority. So he's just spoken about, you know, uh, what the majority is looking for and that what we're seeing uh, usually where the leadership is concerned is that their actions don't reflect what, you know, the vast majority want. But then if we look at uh, countries like those in the Arab Spring, or if we look at South Africa, for example, where there's definitely, uh, some people argue that Julius Malema is a populist, for example. Um, so what do you then do when you're now put in, in, in the position of governance and you aren't able to make good of very many of these promises? that you had made what is the danger because you know on the one hand we're speaking about democracy on the other hand it's a fine line now that we're, we're towing between that and populism which is, is now appearing to be an alternative to democracy as we know it how do we ensure that we're not going into from, from the frying pan to the fire it's 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 really a thin line because you have a situation where people go from being helpless to hopeless so they are helplessly hopeless. They look at the situation and say, there is nothing that they can do. So the best they can do is adapt to the situation. For example, in Nigeria, it gets to the point where people say, we will survive. Because if we have been able to deal with a lot of issues over the years and we are still here, then it means that this 
too will pass. And it's really very, very unfortunate because it affects the mindset of the people and they are stuck with bad leadership and they make excuses for irresponsibility and incompetence. But what we must do as a people is have an understanding of our system. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, for example, you cannot aspire to um, elective office if you are not a member of a political party. Now, if you become a member of a political party, if the party is structured in a way where you have to um, you have to uh, control to the whims and caprices of a handful of people, aka the cabal, then whatever laudable idea you have will die in your bedroom. Because when you come up with such ideas, they tell you no, there's nothing you can do. And party supremacy. So it's really very, very unfortunate. Now, the old news lies on the people themselves to have an understanding and say, if over the years we've had to deal with this situation, how then do we improve? So you begin to educate yourself, this person, teach the other person, and try to participate actively in the process. You cannot have, in the case of Nigeria, a population of, say, 200 million people, and you have over 70 million, you know, strong voting population. And at the end of the day, you know, a fraction of that um, number get to decide who would preside over the administrative affairs for a particular period of time. So you have people saying, well, I didn't participate in the election. It's a thing of pride in certain parts of Africa where people hit their chest and say, I did not participate or I don't participate. Some people even count the number of years mm -hmm. that they have not participated in the process. So they have zero worries. And it is really very, very unfortunate because if democracy is essentially popular participation, and we have a situation where, you know, um, for want of, uh, you know, a term to describe, Doubts mm. just elect their representatives, then you would have people run the system aground and there'll be no development whatsoever. Mm. Okay, so essentially the the health of the democracy is also very much the responsibility of the electorate. I'm, I'm, that's what True. I'm getting from what you're saying. Okay, so we're going to take a short break, but next we take a look at some of the African countries with the elections coming up, and we assess the governance and threats to democracy in those countries. Remember, you can keep in touch with us on social media. We're at New Central TV on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Use our hashtag NC the conversation to weigh in. We'll be right back, and we're talking democracy still. Stay with us. We're a medium of trust in a world of speculation and opinion. Developing a narrative of Africa that is true, compelling and relatable. We're challenging misrepresentations, stereotypes and false perceptions. Disrupting the African conversation and driving the agenda for inclusive and objective reporting in politics, business culture, entertainment, and sports. We are amplifiers of previously untold stories, giving equal prominence to reports across Africa. We are tickers of today's events with reliable, timely, and responsible coverage of evolving issues. We are charting the narratives that define Africa to the world. You're welcome back. This is The Conversation and I'm Sibu Sisiwe If you're just joining us, we're discussing results from research carried out by Cambridge University. It shows that there's a huge disillusionment with democracy by people across the globe. So it's not just us in Africa. Remember, this is a conversation with you. So keep in touch with us at New Central TV on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Use our hashtag NC The Conversation so we can keep track of what you're saying. I'm still with my guests, Peter and Chukudi. Now we're getting into particular case studies in Africa. Three countries in particular. One in West Africa, East Africa, and Central Africa. You remember earlier this week, uh, in fact, I think it was last week, uh, we covered the findings of Transparency International on corruption. And it found that Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest score with an average of 32. Now, this year will prove important as a benchmark because we're going to be looking at whether African citizens and our regional organizations along with the international partners will tolerate efforts to erode democratic norms by national leaders and the external collaborators or whether there's a renewed effort that's going to be made to uphold certain standards with grain with gaining traction pardon me let's take a look at three case studies now togo burundi and central african republic they're all holding elections this year they all have uh, their own challenges uh, if we start for example with uh, togo where mm -hmm. the nyasimbe family has essentially whether you want to call it a democracy or not some some would argue that that essentially has been a, a monarchy disguised as a democracy so in a country like that where we've seen um, the constitution being amended in order to benefit one particular sect of that uh, country what do you do um, to ensure that the citizens are not disillusioned by the idea of democracy there 
I think what you must first accept that they don't have a democracy in Togo. <laughs> there is no democracy. There is an outward appearance of democracy that is purportedly sanctioned by elections every four, four yeah. years or five years or whatever term limits the president wishes to have. You know, there is that, but that was, that's not what democracy is all about. Democracy is not just about, you know, conducting very flawed, you know, deter, predetermined elections at intervals. Democracy, as I said earlier, is about um, critical things like civil liberties, uh, freedom of the press, pluralism, which means that the majority do not prey on the minority, uh, a constitution that is well respected, separation of powers, mm. an independent judiciary, and also, you know, um, law, a body of lawmakers. These are things that make a democracy uh, and a functional government too, as well. All of these are absent in countries like Togo where a particular family for over four decades now have been determining the political whims and also the management of the country according to their own selfish and personal desires. So this election, uh, I, I, I'm not going to discourage you from participating in it because there is a chance uh, that if the opposition party are able to unite, uh, they could actually house this uh, man and his family from power. Yeah. But we must not uh, you know, make the mistake of calling what they have in Togo a democracy because when we do so, we are promoting an unhealthy view of what democracy, what democracy is. truly is. But, you know, on the topic of the opposition parties, and again, I, I don't know if this is putting too much responsibility uh, on, on the people, but the the opposition itself is not organized. Yes. Uh, there's, there's much disunity yes. there. And, you know, the diaspora, try as they might, aren't able to pull together um, what has become a factionalized opposition. So are we also seeing, you know, also where that is concerned, an unhealthy exercising of our democratic rights as a people? Because they're being disunified they're being disunified is not an is not a reflection on the government that's a reflection on their inability to organize themselves i think they have a misguided objective right you cannot fight for a share of um, war that you have not even won okay you know they're trying to fight for dispose of war they have not won the war the war and it's not about just claiming power and that's what i think is very central to many political movements in africa they are too concerned about how to manage power mm. how to govern the country uh, as opposed to setting institutions in place and creating a functional governance where you don't need to access power for you to live a good life, for you to be able to afford the basic necessities of life. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, put in place an institution where the government has to work for the people, then the economy can be better. Then people can begin to, you know, pursue their desires in other areas of life. So I think that the opposition in Togo must understand that what is at stake here is the survival of the country. And that cannot happen if they don't have a constitution that can be respected mm -hmm. and implemented, that cannot just be amended because a president says so. They need to understand, they need to redefine the political space of the country. And then that's why they must come together. They must share all of this um, central objective and agitate for it, as opposed to them trying to say, oh, I will produce the president, you will produce all of this. All of that will not happen if this man remains in power. So institutions essentially that outlive the terms that people have in power. Institutions that are more powerful mm. than any individual in the country. That should be the essence of democracy. Yeah. It's really unfortunate that even if he's ousted from power, you're still going to have this same situation mm. because it's same of the same. Yes. These people just want to smash and grab. They just want to hold office. So there is no idea of what you want to do for the people. And that is where there is a problem. So the foundation should be, we must have a constitution that we all agree and will be respected. But I'm afraid, I've tried to do some study and try to make sense out of, you know, trying to share power even before you even get power in the first place. And I feel that it's just desperation to occupy the office. Mm -hmm. So for them, the united front is, we need to get this man out of power, but I'm afraid that they will turn against each other and might even be worse off. Happens. Yeah. Okay, so another thing that's central to a democracy is state sovereignty. And that has been a bit of a double-edged sword on, in Africa, right? Because yes. this is why people accuse the AU, for example, of being a toothless organization. Uh, and then some of our regional powers, to their credit, ECOWAS has been instrumental in ensuring that the... the, the constitution was not further amended uh, where Togo was concerned. But so what do you do in that instance? You want to respect a country's democratic right to remain sovereign. On the other hand, you understand that there are so many other things that make a democracy healthy. Where do we toe the line as Africans, especially because most of our democracies are relatively new? So I think it's holding people to a standard. I, I complain about the African Union. I mean, there are several cases across Africa, South Sudan, Somalia, Ethiopia, and you do not see anything. But when it comes to 
you know, how you can help your friend perpetuate themselves in power because, you know, the person would return the favor. You see leaders smiling and taking photos. It's really very, very unfortunate that if you go back and look at, you know, the vision of the founding fathers, you know, Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, and other people who looked at Africa and said, this is the beautiful bride. We must galvanize, pool resources as a people. Have one vision. And if we have that vision, people from the outside would not exploit us. Yeah. But it is really very, very unfortunate that because of greed, you would have people who no longer see the African vision. All they see is how they can line their pockets. And it's really very, very unfortunate. And I think that the African Union should wake up to its responsibility or just oh. remove the Africa before the Union and just answer maybe town union. Because I don't understand how in a continent that is blessed with abundant human and natural resources, we cannot still explore to optimum capacity. Really very, very unfortunate. Mm. Okay, and then my final question is uh, a question about the, the dissatisfaction people have seen in some of the biggest global powers, uh, the, Euro the European Union states, the United States as well. So who checks those countries for you know, some of the issues where their democracies are concerned. They're incredibly involved in African democracies and ensuring that we're doing what we need to do. Yes. Uh, but who checks those global uh, powers? I think that there is um, sort of like a coalition. For instance, in, in the, um, the UK, there is the European Union, even though now it has been you know, battered mm -hmm. and it's reduced to nothing. But I think that they also have internal checks. Now, uh, part of the thing that makes Africa a difficult region to deal with is because there is no shared belief, there is no shared vision. Uh, historically, it has always been like that. Even in Nigeria, uh, we've had different empires with different aspirations. So, you know, bringing people together who don't have a shared vision can be very difficult. But if you look at a country like America, for instance, they were the first country, I think, in the earlier centuries that a revolution in the, con in the country produced a democracy. So historically, they've always tilted towards a government led by the people. They've gone astray a couple of times. Under Richard Nixon, there was an overbearing influence of the government, but they always find a way back to their roots because it's what they believe in innately. And like I said earlier on, what we are seeing now is actually um, a protest against the, the, uh, the bad state of politics yes. in the country and the overly partisan nature that governments usually take. When all of that is fixed, particularly the gerrymandering system that enables the government to alter you know, political voting in their own favor, when all of this is fixed, I think that the people naturally always want a government that represents them, not authoritarianism, mm -hmm. not too much state powers and the like. So when they fix these problems, they will always return back to base. Okay, and my final question for the two of you, rapid fire questions. First question, will democracy thrive in Africa? Not should it, can it, will it thrive in Africa? At the moment, I don't see it thriving. No. Yes. Unfortunately, no. Are we ready for an alternative system of governance? Yes, no. I don't think we're ready for an alternative, which is why I'll continue to agitate for us to fix our democracy. Okay. Fix our democracy. Fix our democracy. Okay, so no. Both on, on. Okay, so it looks like this particular panel does not agree with the results uh, in, in terms of being dissatisfied with democracy. We believe in it, but we also believe that we're not carrying it out the way that we should. Remember, this is a conversation with you. Tell us what your thoughts are on democracy or perhaps an alternative system of governance on social media. We're at New Central TV on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And our hashtag, as usual, is hashtag NC the conversation. For all the latest and current affairs, do visit our website, www dot new central dot africa this has been the conversation thank you to my guests for joining me i'm sibu sisi wenyanda from me it's goodbye for now